yes, profit is king. Yes, you want to make sure you're keeping a lot of that. For me early on, I knew like if you can have high revenue in this model, you're going to be okay. Building the airplane in the air, that's what we've done. And that's sometimes that we continue to do when you're growing fast. And I think that's a big lesson for everybody. It's a war of attrition, the fitness industry. So if you manage yeah. to survive 10 years, uh, a lot of the people on the front end are still going to be around. And they'll remember how you treated them. Hello and welcome to this week's Gym World Worldwide. I am your host, John Franklin, and I am not joined this week by my co-host, Mateo Lopez. He is in South Carolina enjoying the final days of summer. Uh, But to make up for it, I brought you an extra special guest. So every time someone comes on the show, we email them after the fact and say, hey, who would be a good fit for the show? And over and over and over, this name kept popping up. It's like, oh, this guy would be good, but he's going to be tough to get. He likes to keep a low profile. He doesn't like to share his numbers, but we've been consistent. We've been grinding. And that's why you come to this show, because we we pull these guys uh, from their hiding place and tell them to give you all their secrets. So without further ado, we are going to learn from the man, the myth, the legend, the mind, meathead Mark Ennis. How are you doing? Hey, John, it's one of, the, one of the best intros I've probably ever gotten. So I appreciate that. And, you know, we got a little bit of time here. So we're trying to get all the secrets out and, and definitely uncovered it. It's been a long time in the making, but glad we will connect today and looking forward to the, the chatting today. So your gym is Power Strength Training Systems. Give us a little insight into uh, how you started and how you and what it is today. Yeah, the sh- short version, I would start with, we've been in business 13 and a half years now, started in 2011, 24-year-old kid. Similar like most stories that you've heard on here is I was just kind of that meathead, right? That's where that name comes from, for real, meathead mark. Um, and one of the train athletes was coaching high school football, volunteering, you know, doing all that kind of stuff before I had the gym. Local kid, stayed local, built a network up, um, started small, like everyone has talked about before, but then we kept expanding. I always wanted to knew I wanted one bigger place and that happened. And then we kind of just kept the momentum rolling. And now we have five facilities, well, four facilities building, building our fifth and then uh athlete, adult athlete, adult model. So basically our athletes, we kind of, well, I guess we'd say we've gotten that small group personal training model for both the athletes and the adults, which is pretty rare and serving two masters get into that a little bit about really we've been able to scale that and it's pretty unique but yeah it's six to one on the adult side and athletes same thing six to one um primarily and we do high school and youth primarily we've dabbled in some professionals we have our college kids in the back in the summertime all that stuff but uh, imagine like a small group model like on the adult side like having that under your roof but completely separate right next door is just your athlete sports performance gym and being able to do that now four times our facilities are about eight to 12,000 square feet. And that we, we can dive into that, but yeah, four of those and we're build, building our fifth right now. So it's been quite the ride, um, 30 team members, which I'm pumped about. I mean, we can dive into that too. Cause I know that's a, that's a big thing in today's age, but any business, but definitely in today's world and how to really scale a team truly too. So that's kind of the gist of it. Um, and it's just been a wild, wild ride for 13 years, but really the last four years. This is our third gym we're opening in four years. So, and these aren't just little small studios; these are big behemoths. So, it's been a looking back on it, it's kind of crazy to think through, but we can dive in on that a little bit. But that's that's the short version. It's pretty good. Uh, lines up with my notes. You know, your story checks out. It fact checks. So you started. Good. You started as like an intern at a like Precy Speed School, right? School. Yeah, I was. Yeah. Yep. And then uh, started an intern at a, a crazy speed school back in the day. Um, the short story is I was in, I was so detailed with my college schedule. I wanted to have like no classes my senior year. So from my freshman year all the way through, I planned a perfect schedule. So my senior year, I could just relax. And that was the exact opposite. I started coaching high school football. I got multiple internships. And then it was the busiest year of my life in that up until that regard. And one of those was a uh, entering at, at a Parisi and getting that kind of the first step, my first step in the door with uh, really in private sector training. And so you you started in 2011. 
Mm-hmm. You were 24 at the time. So you were you working pre C up until you started uh, no. more strength? Or- no, thanks for bringing it up. They didn't hire me at all. I applied even for a front this was inside of a health club um, and they're no longer in business. So I can say this freely, of course, and who knows what, what would have happened. And funny story is fast forward five years and that same facility came knocking, wanted a power strength to go in there. And I said, this is, this came full circle now because I, applied, I think I got a little shaky there, but like I said, I said, I applied for a front desk position. And I never got a call back and I applied to be a trainer there and never got a call back. So writing was on the wall, which was a blessing in disguise. And I just had to forge my own path from there, which was, which was the right move in the long run for sure. But that's kind of how I got the start. Um, typical Joe DeFranco disciple, everything he put out, I consumed. He was one of my earliest mentors. And then uh, him and Smitty going to the CPPS certification years years ago now, 2012. And kind of was a nerd, training nerd in that regard through and through. So I went from like the training route first, and then I stacked on the business afterwards, which I think is the way to go. But it worked well for us, it worked well for me. And that's kind of my early, early years and early mentors, I should say. So when you say you went the training route first, you developed your skills in athlete development programming mm-hmm. and then got your business shops is the, sure. the message you're giving sure. to the gym world. For sure. And that's like, it's been documented where I haven't, uh, the first three years of running the gym, I didn't even call, I didn't answer the phone. I didn't track a lead, none of that. And then, but we're growing every year, year after year. And you're just kind of, you care about the training, you care about the service, you build those relationships, especially me being a hometown hometown guy like that really mattered to me so that's where my focus was and then it was like oh man this thing's getting kind of big but kind of that next level of like mentorship became more business business mentors masterminds you know so that was the earliest mastermind i joined was in 2014 so over 10 years ago now and i was that guy that just kind of was like kept going back like and i kept going back so imagine six to eight trips a year for a decade that was me and sometimes more never really less. And even to this day, like we're still traveling, we're still learning. And then you pick your head up and you're like, oh man, this is a pretty big business and it's, it's worked out pretty well. So there's a lot of method, I think methodology in there, but also just a lot of mindset of just always moving the chains and keeping things going. And that's kind of how I got it, how I got rolling and still what we're doing today. It's definitely a commonality of some of the more successful gym owners. They go out and experience what else is out there i saw a post recently with did did james come to you james pratt or did you go to him when you guys were i was down in uh i was down in new jersey for another event too with my mentors with with vince gabriel i've coached with him for years of course and then i know uh, james stepped out of mike baker's place i know mike for years went up to my buddy's place at varsity house like really connected and and again you go to masterminds and training seminars for a dozen years like you get pretty connected and if guys are still in the game then you probably have crossed paths over the years especially in those circles so those guys like again then you have like your your Devin Gage and your Connor Flahai who's a good buddy of mine really smart people that you just kind of bump shoulders with and build build really good relationships with and so on and so forth but yeah just just was catching up with those guys this past summer yeah, the world is really small once you get to uh, once you've been around the block for a little while. For sure, uh, that's why it's important to have a good reputation on the front end because it, yeah. it follows you everywhere you go. And it's a war of attrition in the fitness industry. So it if does. you manage yeah. to survive ten years, uh, a lot of the people on the front end are still going to be around. And they'll remember how you treated them in the front. Uh, sure. Your your gym story is a perfect example. You know, you, you, you should yeah. write a nasty letter to Mike Parisi to let him know, you know, or Bill Parisi. Okay. Sorry. It turned out. Okay. It turned out. Okay. I'm all right with it. <laughs> water, that's water on the bridge. But I also think there's little, you know how it is. Like, like there's always little benchmarks that you kind of want to just, you know, put that chip on your shoulder and keep going and whatever motivation you need. I think in business, I think that's, we want it to be healthy, but you gotta, have, you gotta have that fuel. It's too hard of a business. It's business is is hard, let alone being in the fitness business, is hard, let alone to be really successful for a really long time. So whatever keeps you going, you know, as long as it's healthy, then then use all that momentum and motivation that you can possibly have. So you said you started small. Tell me about that that first location that you rented. Yeah, we refer to it as the garage. It was basically, it, it wasn't more than 15, the building was 1,500 square feet. So less training space than that. It was an abandoned auto, auto glass garage. And I think we had about eight yards of usable turf 
that we added after we opened and it was about eight feet wide. Like it was a very, just a small little strip and we could fit, uh, we had two racks in there then we expanded and we knocked on a wall and then we had a third rack. So, but it was our first four and a half years of business started off exclusively athletes turned away a lot of adults and then the adults just kept knocking. So we plugged them in. We, we felt like we could, we, it was terrible. Like we moved them around like, Oh, athletes are getting busy. You guys are now going from five 30 to seven 30. Hope you're okay with that. Like didn't even think twice about it. Just like change the schedule and you're good to go. But that still got traction. It's a really close knit um, root system that we were able to, I refer to as the root system that we're able to like plant. And from there just kind of, accelerated and expanded to our, we kind of didn't go in the middle. We went straight from 1500 square feet to a brand new 10,000 square foot space back in 2016. So we kind of skipped some steps and that's when the business stuff really got real and you have bigger numbers and you have bigger debts and it's just a big, uh, it was a big transition. Yeah. Cause you said you joined your first business group 2014 it sounded like from 2011 to about that time you were doing everything wrong except for the training and, and getting people results, but the business still managed to grow year over year. I'm assuming you got yeah. some value out of those groups, got your shit together, started making a little money. The Alpine location, the one you opened in 2016, did you build that one? Do you own that one or is that a uh, rented location? We rent that one currently, but we were involved with, that was a brand new building. We were involved in that build out. So we contributed a little bit to the build out back then. Like just, hey, we need a couple offices. We need a bathroom that's probably two bathrooms actually in a couple offices that's all we could really rub together scrape together um right to this day and that's one that we do rent and then yeah then 15 months later is when we went to number two and that was an existing facility that we had to kind of re we remodeled that one but at least it had flooring and turf already in there worked out a great deal for some existing equipment brought new equipment in so we were able to expand pretty rapidly in really 15 months and uh that was really interesting because you learned i learned a ton and you were just you never really caught your breath. And I don't think I still caught my breath since then, but it's, that was, that was a really big turning point in, in the business. And I'll borrow this saying from my buddy Connor, of course, is building the airplane in the air. That's what we've done. And that's sometimes that we continue to do when you're growing fast. And I think that's a big lesson for everybody is like, we chose, a, I chose, especially that we big period of growth. Then then I was trying to do a third team. Wasn't ready. Your systems wasn't ready. The business isn't ready. And then COVID hit delays a little bit. And then we expanded number three in COVID. So there was like a, there was a three and a half year gap. And then from there, it's just been grow fast. But I think that's important to know, like when you're growing stuff is not right. And so I'd rather be in growth mode as short as time as possible. So like right now we're like in growth mode and we're just going to keep, and we're just pouring it on. We'll see what happens next year, but there's so much that has to happen when you're growing that I don't want to jump in and out of that. And because growth is hard. We always say growth and comfort can never coexist. And I think that's the biggest thing that people think, oh, it's fun to expand. We need to expand. It's like, we better be ready to go. You better have a lot of things buttoned up. And we can dive into that a little bit. But I just want to touch on that because anytime we talk about that fast expansion, like it was not easy. It was super hard. We made a ton of mistakes. But we learned and we, again, my whole goal is to be build an anti-fragile business. And that starts with me and being anti, having an anti-fragile mind anti-fragile leadership mindset and leadership ability. And that's comes from pushing the envelope a little bit and expanding your comfort zone. So I would like to touch on that when we talk about the fast turnaround, the fast expansion. Yeah. 1500 square foot garage to two 10,000 square foot facilities in like a, basically a year. 15 months. Yeah. The second one's 12,000. The second one was 12,000, but who's counting. Right. But it's like, yeah, those are big, big stuff. And it just kind of happened like, yeah, this is the next step. You know, I always had this mindset of if people say like, why do you do what you do? Why are you training? Why do you want to own a business? Right. We always talk about it. And so like, I want to impact people. And it's like, for me, it was like, yeah, I want to impact and help people and influence people in my hometown. And if that was true, then why would I not aggressively expand? Why would I not try to help more people in person and do that? So if I'm, if that aligns with my so it kind of lines with my vision and I'm not going to say something I don't mean. So how do I really live that? And that's where it's tough because everyone says that, but then their actions have to match. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you're going to say this, this is what you're about, then your actions have to match. And that was always big for me of reevaluating, like, are we on track with this? This is still what I want to do. Yes, it is. And let's go full bore and it's going to be uncomfortable, but like, we'll figure it out. I'll trust myself to figure it out. Trust my team to figure it out. And that's just kind of where we're at today. 
So when you went from one to two, was the goal just to own two? Or are you, you know, early on when you're on the mission, I want to have a hundred of these locations. Like what? No, I've always struggled with the vision. I've always struggled with the vision of how many. I wanted to expand, like I mentioned before, I just wanted to have one big one and then start small, have one big one. Then you achieve that. Then it's like, what's next? And you're kind of just, it was a good period of growth. You're learning a bunch. You not necessarily, I don't, I wouldn't call it like keeping up with the Joneses. Like, but I was, again, I was in those groups you're competing the opportunity presented itself it was across town it wasn't going to be as much to expand that one because it was already existing so it's like this is a good this is a good growth like and i always want again one of my things was like i wanted to make sure i could provide or impact my people in my community hometown community but i also want to provide for my team and that's kind of why we continue to expand i had a great team at that time i want to give them opportunities how do you do that? Well, you go expanding and you replicate what you're currently doing. What made that one more fun and challenging? I got engaged and married during that time frame. My, six months, two months after opening that second one, my wife quit her job. That was our that was our like secure income. And we didn't we don't even think twice. We, we weren't even really thinking about it, didn't blink. And you're just kind of in that zone of all we gotta do is again show up and build this thing and see what happens. And that's that's kind of was in hindsight, it's like ignorance is bliss. And you know, I kind of remind my remind myself of that, but um the risk was as great and you can kind of just roll with it and it was perfect timing those pre-kids those pre-kids those pre-family life everything so that was the time to do it for me yeah i did i did all that uh expansion stuff pre-kids i can't imagine trying to do it with a family yeah. um and i say that now and i have a family and we're still expanding it's just a little bit different but the, though that root system was built that first i guess you know six seven years a lot of time was spent to make it so this expansion, these expansion stuff can happen now, which I also will tell the listeners too, like definitely don't compare at all, but definitely don't compare to this because these fast expansion, these bigger buildings, this business model, which, which we can get into a little bit is very unique, but that six to seven year period is that foundation that we have to go off of. So if you don't have that six to seven year foundation, it's going to look different. It's going to look different for everybody, but it's definitely going to look different for you. If we try to try to skip a few steps, that's why I try to tell a lot of people now when they look to see what we're doing, it's kind of, it's pretty unique. So I don't, I wouldn't try to replicate what we're doing at all. So it sounds really hard. So we talked about you, you're serving two masters here and dealing when, when I talk to sports performance gyms, people who train athletes, but also have an adult program, they're always like, what's my avatar? How do I talk to someone on my website? I thought it was pretty funny that you literally just split your site down the middle and just click which one you are. And then, and we'll try and talk to oh. you that way, because yeah. I'm sure you've been through plenty of iterations of that. Uh, it's definitely a unique challenge. So we talked about on the adult side, you do small group, personal training on the athlete side. What type of programs do you offer? Yeah. So it's funny bring the website up. We're, re we're re redoing it right now. It's been a project for a long time, but we kept opening gyms and kind of got tossed to the side. So website, good websites, very important, but also serving your, if your team, developing your team, hiring the right people and making great services, I would say are more important, but we're going to get a new website up like in a month. So, but you're right. Like we struggled with it before I had, I had back in the day, I had multiple web guys like you shouldn't do this. Just have different tabs. I'm like, this is what we're doing. This is the mindset. This is exactly what I want it to be. Like we can train, we can serve two masters. We have to be really good to do that on the service level. And it's not just the training. I think the training is actually a little bit the easier part. It's the personality, it's the discussion. It is not right with whatever business model it is, or just like at a kid's class or at an adult or an adult class. I've always, always like, if we're not going to be the good at that, then why would I risk my reputation adding that if we're not prepared for that? And so that's why I used to turn adults away and for a long time and, like, we're not ready to do that because it was just me. They added revenue. I remember sitting in my first mastermind meeting and they were telling me, just add a 6 a.m. adult, add a 6 a.m. adult. I'm like, I wasn't ready to do it. And I just said, no way. So because that deep rooted sense of like, I got to be, if we're going to be the best and the brand, build the brand the right way for the long haul, then we got to be the best at this. So, um, and that just, that's training. That's the sales process. That's the marketing messaging. That's everything. So now we kind of done pretty well at that. And so now when somebody comes to our door, it's okay. Well, what, what are they going through where they sign up? Now we try to replicate the adult and athlete processes as similar as possible. Now, especially now at, at scale and having 30 people be on the same page, which we're still always refining that. 
but yeah, like the athlete side, I mean, again, if they're youth, um, athletes are dictated by really their sports, their schedule. That's all. That's always the Holy grail of that. Um, I would say the whole, the schedule is the Holy grail of, of your performance business for sure. Um, you have a limited amount of time. So what's, how do you serve the most people, but also have the highest margin, but also how are you unique? We're very, we're one of the few people that do a six to one athlete to trainer ratio because it's very hard to replicate. You need more staff and you need to pay those staff a good chunk and you need to charge a good chunk to be able to afford that staff. But we've been able, we've been able to make that work and it's pretty systematized on the training front. I don't want to nerd out too much, but different tiers. Everyone doesn't, everyone isn't walking around with their own program, but everyone does have unique goals and notes and injury history that our trainers are familiar with. And then we assign them a different program and, and accelerate them um, accordingly through that multiple testing periods, different tracking, all that kind of stuff to be able to not only for the athlete to see the progress, but also the parent. So that's, that's been really helpful for us. We've been, we've been doing that a long time. We, and we train a lot of, a lot of kids. Wait, and is it all six? It's all six to one on the entire our youth, youth our side youth, as well? Yeah. Our youth side, we go a little bit higher. I was going to say some usually, of these pictures look like there's more than usually like eight to 10. Some of those pictures are probably freaking old. So it's like, but it's like the, uh, yeah, we don't go more than definitely don't go more than 10 on the youth side. And if again, is it running, are we running a, like a more of a front end, like quick, like speed camp, or are we run actual sessions? We will look at the group. Like we have, when you have flexibility and you just built this in because you, you know, you have to know your boy, well, like 10 kids are coming. This needs two coaches because these kids are brand new. This kid's like, so we can just have them, have them do that. We structure that and built that in as needed. That allows us to, again, serve the person, serve the client, make sure they have the best experience possible, not because the model doesn't allow for it. And I think it's, that's super hard to replicate, super hard to compete with. What's unique is that most people will go 10 to 15. And to me, that's basically like a large group. That's similar to high school. How can we differentiate from that? And so we had to dictate that just by our model. And we ran it as long as we could like that. And really until COVID happened, allowed we we and this is it. COVID happened. We opened our third gym. Just can manage all those kids and give them a great experience. But our onboarding new trainer was too big of a gap to get caught up to speed like that. So we had to reevaluate. And that was the perfect time to do that. So um, we really maximized that time and really allowed ourselves to be tough to compete with on that regard. So and then the adults, same thing, six to one, Sim similar to what you guys, if you've heard before on this podcast before, imagine having small group personal training studio next door and then having your adults right next, next to it as well. And being able to staff that accordingly or share staff within those programs. That's something we've been able to, to navigate as well. So we can able to offer better roles, better schedules at a higher compensation because especially if they coach both groups, which is very unique. And so that's then that's part of our training and our onboarding system that's kind of unique to us. But it's a we demand a lot of those trainers for sure. If through a 72 year old, then that's pretty good. And so you said uh, your first locations were around ten thousand. The next one was twelve thousand. Are they all kind of they all fall fall in that like nine to twelve thousand range? They're closer to ten. Um, the third one we did was a complete remodel during COVID, which I don't recommend doing. Timing was right. I walked through that building a year prior, said no way, needs too much remodel, and then COVID happened, and all of a sudden now it's a good idea. So we started the remodel during really August of twenty twenty. Opened in January, and that was a full full remodel. That one technically is a safe 500 square foot footprint, but we have some mezzanine space up top that kind of off a pretty good chunk of mezzanine space up top off 500 square feet. So it's about 9,000 in total usable. Um, so that was, yeah, that was number three. And then number four is about 11. And then this newer building is, is about 10 and a half, 11. And so you got the two programs going during your peak hours. How many simultaneous programs are going on at the same time? We'll have the extreme would be five, like, I mean, I don't know. It varies by location um, and a little bit of the setup, but like our busiest location that we're expecting this winter that we're expecting even past the last winter, we'd have, there's some overlap. There's about four, five or they potentially could be five or six happening at once groups of six happening under that roof. So, and then the people rocking and rolling plus coaches. 
It's a unique energy. It's a unique environment. Been to a lot of, seen a lot of gyms, been to a lot of gyms, and it's it's definitely unique in that regard. Our coaches are buttoned up. They're dialed in, and and everyone's going to get what they need. But, yeah, when the places like that, coaches are really dialed in. They're ready to go. Um, the whole facility is laid out with equipment and space, so we know exactly where each session is going. Um, I think it's super important. And also, this goes back to our root system in the garage. We're so used to having 20 athletes in this tiny space. How do you get through equipment? How do you have set up with a lot of spaces and a lot of programs to this day and age? So we, we've really focused on that and really nerd out about that so we can make it as effective as possible and people aren't moving around um, as much. The, the funny thing is, like, when we move from the garage to that first bigger space, the hour session kept going like an hour 15. Like, what's going on? Well, we, we weren't used to walking so much in the session and the, the flow was all terrible and bad. So we were able to kind of address that. And um, not every facility is pretty dialed in like that. And also we'll have every Skylar Davis, who's my guy who lived for 10 years. He was in that garage. He'd been with every, every facility along the way. He's our director of programming. So he programs for every program. And we were able to scale that across, educate on the program, have multiple training meetings per month, talking about that and, and being able to scale his expertise has been invaluable. And my other next guy, Brock, Coach Brian, has been with me for also t- 10 years ago. He was an intern, you know, like, and he's now he's with us again. And so it's just like having reliable veteran guys like that. 10 years in this industry, you're a dinosaur if you've been training sessions that entire time, which they have been. So super high level, super um, advanced. And we've been able to, that's how we've been able to scale our expertise across multiple facilities with a lot of new coaches coming through the door. Yeah, it's a lot of time on the floor. Hey gym owners, are you looking for a way to generate more leads, close more sales, and increase client retention? Introducing Kilo. We are a software company that gives gym owners the tools they need to increase revenue and run a successful gym. With Kilo, you get a beautifully designed website to capture more leads, an integrated marketing automation platform to increase sales, and our gym management software so you can add new client memberships, process payments, and organize your class schedule. If you're ready to upgrade your gym management software, book a call at usekilo.com. Talk to me because we know we, you know, we know what the program offering looks like now. We have a general idea of the size of the facility, how you run in the classes. You mentioned you have 30 people on staff. Um, mm-hmm. When when a facility is mature, so, you know, when you're opening, you're opening a fifth one now, you know, talk to me uh, what like the model looks like when uh, you're like, this one is rocking and rolling now, or, or as you said, dialed in, like, how many members are you? Yeah, to? it's how many? What's the staff look like? Like, what what are you what are you building to with these new builds that you're doing? It's been interesting, and I want to have like a really good answer, but it's also about the opportunity. Like, even then, the fourth one, our newest one, we opened last last summer. We built that one. That was about eighteen months in the making, and that was just a good opportunity. We knew that other one was going to be busy. We wanted to siphon off from one of our existing facilities. That is our best facility now in terms of just members and what's and now it's like the opportunity came literally the week after actually the first day we opened that facility i was getting calls about another opportunity another building and sure enough that sparked us to look in this and the opportunity was there so we just kind of say yes and then figure it out from there so there's not like a good strategic thing i don't pull metrics of the area the pockets and that's kind of where i go off of and that's not the most you know official professional thing to do but we have a feeling and we just go with it and it works for the between the logistics of our existing facilities so it works so then i would also preface this by saying this is the difference between athlete and adult model especially with bigger facilities where if you just had a adult model only some of these smaller studios like you're capped everything's about the capacity the number of slots so we kind of have the same thing on our adult program i would say but we have such bigger spaces we could always add a coach or we could always add a time slot so for me it's like well how many coaches do i want in that program what's the potential in that area to how many members could we really have is it a member thing or is it more in optimizing the payroll because our payroll is our biggest expense but also for me my biggest a big goal for me and a big investment i like to make but then it's on the athlete side your capacity is limited between really 10 months out of the year that you have three to 8 PM. Really? How much can you do? Can you, how, how much overlap can you have? How do you construct your schedule? Do you go six to one? How much could you really charge? Could you really service what you're charging at a high level, which obviously to us is very important. And again, how many P 
people can you fit? So you, if you have, we've had some, we have some hours that are 18 kids cap capacity, some are 24, you know, we have four sessions running. Could you do that every hour or is that just prime time hours? When I say every hour, that's basically between after, after school, could you do that every hour? Is that really true capacity? I'd say yes. There's so much variation with the adult athlete model to where it's like, we're capped out. I'll, you'll never hear me say capped out because we could always add a little bit more, but it, we do want to get it optimized. Like you said, we know we're not optimized at certain facilities and then we open the next one. You know how hard it is. And we and leave a lot of money on the table and a lot of things fly through the cracks. That's from personal experience. But I think optimal isn't necessarily like a member thing. It's, is it a dollar thing? I don't really, I don't have a straight answer for you on that. I think, I think on ours, we'll aim for like 150 adult members. We, that's a good thing to do. Um, or 125, 150, typical to your studio model, because I'm trying to reduce the number of staff that are only in that program based off the scheduling. And then for our athletes, it could, it could spike. We're riding right the wave of the seasons. So same thing. How do I have optimize the staff? To where I don't have, I don't need eight coaches in the afternoon. I need like four, and that's we're covered. Or sometimes, most of the time, it's two to three. We have a unique model in that regard. So, but we've been able to, you know, as well as a few hundred kids or a few hundred members per location. That's pretty good. That's pretty solid. You're getting into that, you know, anywhere from that 65 to 100K range on average per location. That's pretty good. And that's kind of, just like most people, you're trying to balance that biggest expense for us, which is obviously our payroll. And we have some payroll goals. Like I have goals of how much money I want to pay people and get to, because that means our revenue is doing really well too. There's definitely the mindset. So with, I guess I also round that out by saying too, with the athlete adult model, like, yes, profit is king. Yes. You want to make sure you're keeping a lot of that. For me early on, I knew like, if you can have high revenue in this model, you're going to be okay because that means your marketing is good. That means you're retaining people. That means you also have an influx. You're not having this seasonal dip like the athletes provide. If you can do all of that, now you're something. So I've always, I'm a revenue junkie. I want to tap. I want to hit the revenue goals because that means if we're hitting that other industries, I'm not saying that I'm saying this model, this is, that's, that's when we've been able to nail down. And because like, if you need 1500 lead or what, however many leads we need per month, I think we had, it's like, I, I don't know the exact number of how many leads we have right now, but we how many we're shooting for every month. It's a lot. It's a lot more than, a, you know, getting 20 or 30 a day on the studio side. 20, and then times that by studio four, would five, kill for three. that. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So it's like, yep, we hitting that. We got to hit, you know, there's a lot of leads, but if you can do that and you can sell, you can convert, then you're okay. But that's where it's like the revenue goal is what we're chasing because that means we're not dipping on the athlete side, which means our adult programs are probably doing okay. Um, so you can sell your way out of a lot of stuff. And that's kind of what we do. Um, it's not the best strategy all the times, but if you want aggressive growth and have a high upside, that's, that's kind of what we what we're aiming for too. So to answer your long-winded tangent, to answer your question, how do you optimize it? It's like that anywhere from that six to eight people, eight staff members per location. Most of our time, most of our staff are full time, but we do have a couple part timers as as needed based off the program growth and need. And then we'll, you know, you'll tap out that 120, 150 adults, and usually that two to three hundred athlete member mark. So, and again, that equates to a pretty good a pretty good chunk at the end of the day, and that you have all those options to kind of really, there's always ways to optimize more always. So, so dance, the, the locations dance somewhere in the neighborhood of three, 400 members. And you said mm -hmm. each one's doing neighborhood of 65 to hundred in top line. Yeah. Um, yep. How, what does that math work out to? So, uh, so it's uh, like three to five, that, that's like three to $500 a month for training. Is that what the average person pays? I, we didn't, yeah, we're in that. We're person. actually, yeah, we're actually a little bit, in pricing, again, what we're changing here right now or how it's going to be in a month or two from now is a little bit different. We try to keep it consistent across the board, but some of our locations, are, we're going to have to adjust this a little bit. But, I mean, it's still, we have, well, most of our athletes are training, you know, two to th eight to 12 sessions a month. Um, so two to three times a week on average. The twice a week is, you can still train eight sessions up for under 300 bucks for us. Mid threes, 
mid threes if they're training 12, I think it's like 367. Um, we include a lot with that. And again, it's, it is personal training. I could argue that we're undercharged. We undercharge a lot on our athlete side. I also really, and the pricing for the adults is really similar. I could really, I could argue we're undercharging for that too, but I think it's one of those where it's like, how do you, how do you scale this in the area? And we're also one of those still one of the first people in our area to do small group, especially on the adult side and the definitely on the athlete side. So there's a, there's that education gap of how you live a difference. So we got to be on our game on the sales side of things and let the results kind of speak for themselves, but also push some results to the forefront a little bit of how we're a little bit different. So, so yeah, it's that average cost per member on the athlete side is, you know, I think we're at like two seventy five ish and change. And then that adults is, is relatively similar, maybe a little bit higher, so it's not like we're charging huge numbers. We're in West Michigan, right? We're in Grand Rapids. So there's definitely pockets. There's definitely pockets where we could, but we're trying to keep the model pretty similar. So we just like to really over deliver and make it so people can stay with us a long time. And and yeah, we, some programs are getting, some programs are getting very full for what we want. They need to charge a little more and that's what we'll do. So it's a service-based thing goes first. If there's something with our customer service or our in-gym sessions, that has to be addressed first. So we've hired a lot of people in the last year and a half. So a lot of our focus has been on development and making sure this is up to standard. And could we be charged? If we had to charge more, could we? And one time it was like, no, like not with these people right now we have right now. So we got to get them ready to go. So let's focus on that. So you definitely have to pick and choose what's important to you and when do you want to focus on that? And everything important, nothing is, but we do try to focus on a few, few things uh, at a time when they're our, our size, we have to have uh, multiple progress in multiple areas, I should say. So I think that's a, I think it's a really important note to, or point, important point to make. Yeah. You mentioned the education piece, like Western Michigan is not a particularly affluent area. Like there's some money out by uh, uh, like Michigan. I'm assuming like if you're on the water there, you can probably spend a couple million bucks on a house, but I can't imagine there's much yeah. in Grand Rapids that you can buy for 2 million bucks. I've got, I got Zillow pulled up here. It looks like there's a little pocket mm -hmm. where you got some fancy houses, but you know, where, where are most of the yeah. numbers coming from? Are you, are for you sure there's definitely pockets CrossFit gyms, orange theory. Yeah, like we're they're, they're accustomed to paying 90 bucks a month for a membership. Yeah, or it's just like it's a more of a the, more of a commodity where they haven't done anything. They're already used and conditioned to pay three, four, five hundred bucks a month. They're coming from something cheaper. Or they're coming from either from a again. Our we're, we're we kind of really cater to over forty on the adult side, um, like most people do. But over half of our membership is over fifty, so we're getting that older, older population where they haven't done much. And if they did do something, it was years ago or it was just the health club or something like that. So they're kind of coming. They're kind of coming from all over. So we get it from all sides, but we don't get much from the like the younger like or, like the Orange Theory that group. Other people have tried like a bigger, like a, or like a fit body or, Hey, like I was shoved in there with a bunch of people and my knees hurt and they, they don't adjust. Anything. So it's just whoever they're not getting served the right way and they need specific things. And they're coming to us for that. You know, like most people do in small group and we've been able to customize that obviously in that small session. And, but yeah, from a market standpoint, it's, it's really from all over too. Yeah. We talked to a couple, we talked to a guy who had a bunch of fit bodies out by you and he, uh, he changed it to be small group because he was having trouble, you know, packing out the classes. And... Yeah. Cool. It's a interesting transition because to touch on the staffing point, if you go straight large group, if you're a straight large group and you want to transition to small group, that is a different, almost a different coach in our, in my mind, there's so many nuances. It's totally different. We've had a lot of people come from large group and we've interviewed a lot of people. I've hired, I've, I've interviewed and hired a I'd put myself up against pretty much anybody in the number of people we had to talk through. We get them in the session. It's completely different. Personally serving six to one where you're used to wearing a microphone, just belting out instructions. Um, those aren't the, really the best fit for us. So they really have to start from scratch a little bit. And hopefully they have a good personality and a good rapport and they're open to getting coached up. But it's a totally different coach in that regard, which makes it kind of tough to find a lot of people and a lot of people we bring in up, up through our through our own internship program and whatnot. It's more than an internship program. It is a freaking course and a curriculum, but like through our own internal systems, because like I said, there's not a lot of small group training gyms around us. It's hard to get people with existing experience. And it's the same thing on the athletes front too. They got to really service it. And most of them are coming out without much experience. 18, 12 months, 18 months. A lot of these, hey, this isn't for me, or this is an industry you have to get good at. You need reps at or better yet, like, hey, don't just because just because you can go open your own business or can open up a gym doesn't mean you should right away. And 
just because the business may make sense to you, the service and the actual product has to be refined. So that's my, uh, my wish, I guess you could say, but that's what I recommend to most people is like, go find a place, get some experience, see if this is actually what you want to do. Then you can actually recognize when you have a really good opportunity in front of you as well. This is a place you should grow, grow with that has the potential to grow. Um, and we're getting a lot of hires or candidates just saying that same thing. Hey, I just, I'm tapped out or, Hey, I don't, my schedule is this and that you guys are growing like crazy. How can I be a part of this? What's my upside? And it's like, the upside is high, but you have to have the skills to match it. And that's the, like, that's the thing The guys have been with me a long time is they've adopted that growth mindset. One of our core values is live a complacency kills lifestyle. They live that to a T and that's all that's, that's most of the time that's being, that's really being uncomfortable, but also having confidence in yourself, recognizing this is where I'm lacking the skill, getting that feedback saying this is where we need to develop to get to the next step. Are you open and willing to do that? Willing is the, is the, is the key word there. And then them taking advantage of that. That's the key. And if they, if you have somebody like that, then they will have success, especially in our, in, in our business. Cause we're always growing and always looking for that next thing. But people say, I want that. I want that, but they're not willing to do it. Then their skills prevent them from actually having good earning. So it totally is a entire list all ships mentality we've been able to we've been able to do that in our business because just because we have 30 people facility um there's one company so um it's a giant team so to speak just kind of spread out but so a lot of opportunity within there and it's been really cool to kind of build that but that's a that's an interesting thing we've seen on the on the hiring front and the onboarding front and do you have a general manager for each location or is there like a more of a head coach position uh like who who runs the, who's the captain of each of these yeah. ships yeah, uh, good question. So, and number number five, come we've had to change a little bit. We basically will have a couple of regional managers, and then we have a facility leader. Um, that facility leader also sits in one of our program coordinator seats. So we have an athlete coordinator and an adult program focus on the, on those programs. That facility leader will, will sit in one of those seats. They're the more probably the more senior of those of those two, and then they report to the regional manager. The regional manager reports to the director of operations, and that's kind of our. That's definitely a work in progress. Way a little more complicated than how I just described it, but that's but that's the plan. And we've been able to really streamline the back end. That's something that it's hard to talk about. We are the we are very dialed in on the back end with systems reporting that find the right metrics that we need to make decisions. All that stuff. It's 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 been able to. That's how we've been able to scale and without too much drop off and scale really scale with less people. Because you think about it, we're gonna hire a couple more people here. We'll have a team of thirty two to thirty three. We'll cross five gyms. Like that's all, and that's marketing. That's our business coordinator. Like it's actually not that many people to service eleven hundred, twelve hundred members. That's that we've been able to really uh, alleviate some of that by just through our systems and being really dialed in with the with the data and the metrics. 11 to 1200 of small group, you know, you could do it with way less yeah. if you were doing longer, yes. but, but that's an important distinction there. Right. Um, Big, great distinction. You're exactly right. Um, and, and yeah. so on the coaching side is, do you offer like a base and then a per session rate or is everything based off of how many sessions you coach? Good question. Um, it's definitely varied over the years. And so for now, like we have different tiers and levels and all that stuff. So I'm going to oversimplify this. If you're an hourly step coach, coaching, you usually have a coaching rate and kind of an admin rate on top of that. And then, then we get into, that's pretty much the gist of that. For the, you know, you said most of the people are full-time, low-end full-time people. What are they looking at in terms of general comp? And then towards the top end, you know, what, what are the, what are the top end before you get into these regional? Yeah. And, and coaching and wise, like, again, your hourly coaches entry level, again, this is like zero to six months of experience. So they've been with us or they came through. You know, they're looking at that low to mid twenties dollar an hour type of positions. Then you get into that next tier of coordinators that could be anywhere from that forty to sixty k positions. Then you get into more higher level coordinators, managers. That's anywhere from upwards of of seventy sixty five seventy plus and beyond. And they also have incentive structures too. So, and that's not coaching more than. Usually those people are not coach us. To, and so it's a lot of coaching plus sales plus the management. So they have to wait. They have to be pretty high level on, on a lot of areas and do it at a high level um, to get to that point, which again, in our business now we have, we've had guys that, you know, they can come a, a mid-tier coordinator after 18 months. They're an intern 18 months later, all of a sudden they're, you know, they're running sales, they're running sessions and they're really good at both. And that's been, a, that's a big piece that we had to get better at. And a big piece that I'm really proud of because we used to say, oh, you'll be good. And, you know, give it, 
two years and maybe you'll be able to coach. You need, just need reps. Like we all say that stuff, but now it's like, you need to develop a faster onboarding system and find and hire for this. If you're going to have this many people representing the brand, delivering the service to this many people. So we had to get really good at that and we've been able to do that. And that, now I can look someone square in the eye and say, if they're the right fit and the right person, of course, like, Hey, do really well at this. We're going to develop you. We have planned for this 18 months. You could be here. You know, if you're 24 years old on a salary of working the fitness industry, working like maybe one split shift a week, maybe, and you're not coaching 30, 40 sessions and you're coaching like 20 sessions a week and you're on a salary, like you're a king, you're rich. Like, and I don't know if they recognize that, but we, we are not bashful about saying how good they have it. And then they can work. Hey, this is where you could be in a year. This is where you, um, but you have to learn this and it's not going to, the standard is not going to get lower. It's only getting higher. We'll have over $2 million of payroll. And that's a big goal of mine. It was something that we wanted to achieve. And that's not, and that won't, we actually probably a little bit more and that's your benefits and everything. We, we offer a good, really good benefit package. And that's, that was a, tier and a goal as well, but that's, those are goals now in tiers of, Hey, how we add a little bit to this, how we make this a little bit better. You can't just grow the business just to grow it. You have to grow these positions and take care of your people. Again, a lot of our guys now have families, they have kids, they have, they can't hoof sessions how we used to. Like I've lived all that experience. It's all, I don't want that for them. I would have been pretty happy with my like little garage gym, but I needed uh, to provide some, some roles for my two main guys at the time. They wanted to expand. So now this is about opportunity for our staff. And do I, do I, do I get some benefit off that? Absolutely. Do I risk a lot? Absolutely. But it's kind of fun and it's just kind of, we're, we're still, it's still going. And it's, so it's hard for me to kind of look out right now. I'm in the thick of it right now, but we can get into some of that too on the, on the expansion front. But, um, but yeah. Yeah. I do want to talk about that. Uh, but you did mention sales and you mentioned the lead flow. Yeah, I'm looking at this link in bio. Holy shit, you got a lot of stuff going on back here. And then uh, you go over to this contact form. This is the lo- maybe the longest contact form I've ever seen. So, Oh, yeah, getting- John. <laughs> this, thing, this thing is an animal. So uh, are you getting most – is the idea to, to, to blunt the lead flow or do you get most of your leads from ads? And then who nurtures them? Does it get parsed off at the facility level and the yeah. facility leader is responsible <laughs> for selling? <laughs> This is, I love this stuff. And this is, um, so we've tried a lot of different things. Um, like I said, that's a lot, this is also come from the guy who like never picked up the phone or tracked a lead. Now we use a uh, GR Hoff. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He's a good buddy of mine. Uh, we use his service. I've, I've used him for years, even before he had his agency. So I've kind of been there every step of the way, but also seen the back end of a lot of the CRM systems. I think maybe seven. Or so it was just send them, send them off Facebook, send them off school. So they yeah, fill out this form, see if you're serious or not type of thing. And so we've been able to do that and maintain that a little bit, especially on the athlete side and the adults we've, we've tinkered back and forth lead ad or sending them off site to a straight to a landing page, which was really that contact form just to kind of like pre-qualify, see if they're serious. If they fill out the form, they're probably a little serious. Do a lot of self-booking. We, we do a call with everybody, athlete or adult. Um, we do a free one-on-one assessment slash consultation with everybody. So that's a lot of scheduling as you can imagine. So what we get in front of us, we better, but our athlete athlete lead to close is 65% and our adult lead to close is like 35, 35%. So we're not wasting too much time, but we have a lot of our too much. So we could have a lot more leads, but now we want those quality and gay leads, of course. And we still get plenty of those, but it's just a big undertaking with that. Trying to simplify that really across it. We have to target a lot of different areas. Um, it's all coming from us. So we want this stream of head, like really, you know, ninja, one ninja type salesperson doing some creative stuff. Like we'll get there, we'll find that. But for now, it's like, what's the simplest funnel we could have? Like even the adults for the years, it was just like sell 30 day jumpstart. Like it's discounted. If they can't pay $200, they're probably not going to pay this. So let's just sell a jumpstart and a, begin, a new salesperson can then focus on the service rather than trying to make the sale. Let's get going next season starting. He's he's needs some training. Oh, by the way, yeah, you guys train all the best kids. So yeah, he wants to come. His teammates coming. Let's just get him started. So um, trying, but trying to streamline as much as possible, get as much information as we can before we're, we're for, before we're in front of them, so we can truly prescribe and truly give them what they need. So you're uh, once they get in, you're hitting them with some form of LBO and then just trying to over deliver on the service, and that's how you get yeah. Them back. For now, it's. Um, the athletes, athletes know is pretty much straight. Like, hey, if you're doing assessment, straight to membership. 
and adults, we go pretty much two ways. So we, do, we could hit them with that LBO or we could just sell them right in the membership. It just kind of depends what they need and what they want to do. So I mean, 65% lead to close. I would, yeah. I, I, you don't need an LBO. Sell them right in there. Mm -hmm. In the sake of not dragging this out too long, there's another business, uh, part of the business that I do want to touch on. So you own some of your facilities, right? How, how many, how many of the, you own the real estate for how many of them? Yeah, it's a, uh... It's some kind of like happenstance and it wasn't really always the plan. Got a good connection in the real estate front, but I also have a really good, what I call my dream team. And this is, this is before years ago. So I always talk preface this when I talk about this, especially with gym owners. Like I have a really good, I've always had a great account, great bookkeeping. I, I, I was attorney or attorneys on retainer, great insurance guy, like you name it. I have that. I have a great, now I have a personal CFO. I mean, personal bankers that like, you know what I mean? So it's just like, you need this network to be able to go and do this the right way. And I did this before in, in the garage, basically, uh, before I even had any inkling of expansion or quote unquote success or playing with real money, so to speak. I set myself up because I knew I was planning to have success. I needed experts, you know, like we can't tinker with this stuff too much. So I've had this in place for a long time. So when these opportunities come up, front or what's next or how do i maximize this i play expand wisely and do i take on this debt is this smart debt what's the risk so it's like you need this dream team to kind of bounce these ideas off of and then let, throw the ball on their side of court let them do what they do best and they have their best interest in heart and our business now is pretty complicated so they have to understand our business our model our my personal goals my professional goals and what we want best for our team and all that so it's a big relationship with all these people that to, to maintain that building like i said i looked went through the year before they were remodeled for me to put that much money into it it's like well that building's basically 10 percent, and we got another property too involved in the deal so I, all right let's throw in 10 percent. that was my first real estate dealing i've ever de dealt with a good friend of mine organizes this, sets it up. So it's like, I wouldn't do that probably without him. And then it was our existing, one of our existing facilities. There was always a plan of the current landlords who had the business next door. Hey, sell this to you someday type of thing. So our lease was coming up. You guys still interested? Oh no, I got through. Two weeks into that new lease, it's like actually we're retirement moving. You want this or not? So I had to like, Yes, I want it. Like, I want to make get that done. So we don't, I own half that property. It's got a couple of buildings on it. We're able to do that. The third, the fourth building we built. So now I own, I own pieces of number two, number three, number four has a couple of buildings on that property. I have a piece of a percentage of that one. And then this one we just did, I built myself from the ground up. So that was a different story. Um, that um, here and there is needed, but not much, mostly cash flow, COVID money on the, on that first one. To remodel it, which that went right into the remodel. That was way more expensive than we thought. And then, then this one went through the SBA 504, which I know you guys have talked about on the show before, which I, which was a pain to me because of the construction. If it was just a regular building purchase, I think it'd be really smooth. Construction definitely was a different animal that I was not as used to. That was a big one. And so, or a big learning. Or so, so that was a lot. So yeah, we want to have a little control. And also just because we're the, I'm bringing the tenant mainly with, with power strength coming to these, and it just kind of worked out. We had a nice little thing going with that. So, but then this one, I wanted to kind of like, we knew with new construction, it was going to be a little bit different. It made sense to have more control of that one. And I also kind of wanted the, the challenge to see what that was like. And it's definitely been, been worthwhile, but unique setup in that regard. Not only to have the business model that we have with athletes, adults, having these bigger facilities, having a bigger team, and then, yeah, like taking over an existing gym and then building a couple from the ground up, it's been a lot in that regard. So I've, I don't, I don't say I've done it all. It's been interesting every step of the way and every step you, you learn a little bit more. I'll tell you what though, John, the, some of the headspace stuff of like, you are the tenant, but then now you're also kind of the landlord, especially in some of those investments I'm in where I'm not the sole, sole owner, like you're competing against yourself. You're basically negotiating against yourself, but it's been I, I, in the grand scheme of things, it's been fun. It's definitely been a little bit stressful uh, at times because you're just uncertain. I am not a real estate whiz. I'm not the smartest one at that table. These guys know what they're doing. Um, so it's been fun to learn from them. But 
you just live and learn and every deal isn't the best deal and every deal you learn a little bit more and you get a little bit better on the next one. So it's been fun. It's been a fun experience for me for sure. So you got your hands in the pot of every single one, except for Alpine, it sounds mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. Yep. Which is the original one. And so yeah. when's your new one opening up? Uh, about yeah, seven weeks, seven, eight weeks. We'll see. And so knock on wood, this one, uh, again, that by all having all these buildings and construction time, uh, um, I can also tell you that I don't count my chickens good. So probably early November here in 2024. I was going to say this thing you posted on August 2nd doesn't have walls. So you, you got to get some walls first. Is that my personal one? Yeah, it's my personal one. Yep. That's the thing, John. You know me and like, I'll share some stuff from time to time. But I have been locked in with this one. So I have been focused on my team and growing this one and and uh, I'll get to social media a little bit later. Once in a while, we'll th th throw a story up or something, but I'm staying pretty confined with that. And who knows someday if you stop expanding how I am. Oh, there we we'll, uh, we'll get a little more public with them, some things, but um, that's what I'm saying. Let's just focus on this. All right, there we go. We got we got some photos here. You got some walls. Hey, we'll see that one. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there we go. You got some walls. Um, well, this, this is going to take up a whole episode in and of its own. So what we're going to do is we are going to call ooh, this one here. And if you want to hear more about, uh, Mark's takeover of the Western Michigan real estate market, you got to let me know. If we do that, I'm going to figure out a way to, uh, get to Mark in person so we can control his Wi-Fi, so you can actually hear what he's saying. And we're gonna we're gonna get we're gonna get that knowledge into your head, um, Mark. Man, this has been awesome. Uh, despite the technical difficulties, I still think there's a lot we're gonna be able to take out of this. Uh, and I appreciate it. I know you don't do a ton of this stuff, mm -hmm. uh, but this has been helpful and it's uh, pretty unique. It's a it's cool variation of uh, some of these other models we've been talking about. So. Yeah. Congratulations. I love having me on. Hope you guys can chop it up and get some value out of that on the on the tech side of things. And I'm open to part two. There's a lot to explore, especially maybe if we open this one and can dive in. I love talking about this stuff. I love the show you guys are putting on. There's a lot of cool, a lot of cool uh stories, a lot of cool people that you have on and learn more about that. And again, it's a lot of guys like like myself too that you maybe not hear hear a lot on. And you guys get provide that platform to to dive into that a little bit more. So it's been fun to be a, a listener and a follower, and of course, have having me on the day as a guest. And that's it, Jim World. It is tough to find these uh, these diamonds in the rough, these people hanging out in uh, smaller cities, but doing massive, massive things, making massive change in the community. So if you got value, be sure to like, send us an email. We love hearing from you and uh, share it with the gym owner in need. And until next week, uh, we'll see you.